I remember very well. I had a lot of fun. You know, when we started shooting at Magic Mountain, they closed the park at six o'clock. So I had the run of the park. So I bought a moped and used to drive around all those asphalt trails between the rides. And I crashed a few times, but luckily I had that costume on with all the padding and I didn't get hurt. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, the whole experience for me was pretty good. There was one day that I, I really kind of lost it, and that was when I had a fight with a producer. What happened was I was partying the night before. We had to get up at 7 o'clock, drive to Magic Mountain. Then we had to put makeup on and costumes and stuff. You know, when I had the script, uh, you know, the day's shoot, shooting schedule, and, you know, I, I was supposed to start shooting at around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So, you know, I said, okay, well, I got to do it. So all of a sudden, somebody knocks on the door and they says, uh, excuse me, Mr. Fraley, we're, uh, we're going to be doing close-ups on Gene Simmons all morning. And uh, we won't need you until after lunch. And, uh, you know, that happened more than once. But the second time it happened, I just lost my, I said, forget it. So I ran into the producer's office. This shit's not going to fly with me. You know, you get your shit together. If you want me here at 9 o'clock in makeup, you know, you better make sure you got your shooting schedule right. Because nobody wants to sit around in that makeup and costume for 12 hours, yeah? Anyway, so I, I kind of lost it. I jumped into my Mercedes and took off. My bodyguard followed me. And I like to drive fast. Anyway, I did a quick zigzag. Boom, 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 boom. Went for a red light and uh, I lost him in two minutes. Paul and Gene have gone on record that they hate the film. I think it's hysterical. It's a silly rock and roll movie, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, I mean, they, seem to t they took the film so goddamn seriously that it, it just ruined it for them when they saw the final cut. Expected, you know, Gone with the Wind. <laughs> and look what we got. I hope uh, I cleared some stuff up. The first time I met Cher, it was 1978 at a party Neil Bogart was throwing for Casablanca. At some point in the evening, I found myself talking to Cher. I introduced myself, hey! and she didn't believe that I was who I said I was. It turned out that her daughter, Chastity, was a KISS fan and had encouraged her mother to go to the party because she knew Gene Simmons would be there. But Cher apparently had it in her mind that she would be meeting Gene Simmons, the movie actress. She didn't make the connection. At that time, I was starting to think of ideas for my solo album, which I envisioned as a big production, with tons of guest stars and a circus atmosphere. I thought it would be great if I could get Cher to sing on the record. At the end of the night, I went over to her place. Normally, this would have meant one thing, and one thing only, but in this case, it meant something else entirely. We were back at her place, and before I knew it, we were talking about our lives. She was smart, interesting, and funny. At that moment, at least, I set aside the thought of it turning into anything sexual. She seemed interested in the fact that even though I was a rock and roller, I could put a sentence together, and also in the fact that I was straight and had never been drunk. Early the next morning, 5 or 6 a.m., she drove me back to L'Hermitage Hotel, where I was staying. We parted and agreed to talk more about my solo record. I felt there was something brewing. On my way to New York and after I arrived, I was still thinking about her. One night, while I was in the company of a beautiful young woman, the phone rang. It was Cher. And before I knew it, we were talking again. She wanted to know when I was coming back to California. She wanted to know when we could sit down and talk about the record. It was a strange situation, made stranger by the fact that there was this beautiful girl in the other room waiting for me. In New York, we were working on a new Greatest Hits album, Double Platinum, and specifically on a new disco version of Strutter. This was Neil Bogart's idea. He wanted to mix his two biggest properties, which were Kiss and Disco. At any rate, right when we finished recording the new version, I told the other guys that I had to leave. I was going out to California to see what was happening with the share situation. If you had known me at any time before that, you would have been sure that the guy standing in front of you in the studio was an imposter. I'm the real Gene Simmons. I'm not here to mess around with imposters. What? Leaving without putting the final touches on a song and flying off to see a girl just wasn't something I did. But I was new to this relationship thing. 
Cher met me at the Los Angeles airport. I must have expected things to accelerate immediately, must have expected there to be some activity in the car. But she threw me a curve. There was no sex in the car, just cuddling and holding hands. There was just this kind of giddy sensation that wasn't like anything I'd ever experienced before. When we got back to her house, it was more of the same. Hot chocolate, giggling. <laughs> and before I knew it, I moved in right then. Within the kiss world, the fact that I had gone to California was causing some ripples of discontent. For starters, Ace and Peter didn't like it. They thought it meant they were a secondary priority, that something else was more important to me, and they felt threatened by it. Interestingly, some of the fans felt the same way. KISS fans wanted to see us as hard-working, tough-living New York musicians, reviled by critics, aggressively outside the rock establishment. Yeah. The idea that one of us was living in California with a huge pop star, a huge television star, wasn't immediately accepted. No. Still, however idyllic life with Cher was, I had to get back to work. Around the time of that concert at Magic Mountain, Ace had first announced he wanted to leave the band. We held a band meeting on the lot where we were shooting the movie. In response, Bill and Neil had almost immediately hit on an idea to hold us together. You don't have to leave the band, Bill said. No. We'll do solo albums. Yeah. That turned out to be our next folly. You know, it was like maybe the Beatles' White Album or their Sgt. Pepper, you know, it's when they finally showed their versatility. I mean, when Harrison finally broke out and did his thing, and Ringo finally did his thing. We've got, to, we've got to show everybody there's more talent in the band than just that style. And you're right, a lot of kids just dig the show. Half the times I don't even know if they know what the hell we're singing about or what we're playing about. Since Ace had broached the subject of solo albums during the filming of Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, I had my own solo album on my mind. I had begun working on new songs. In KISS, we all worked differently. Usually, I would walk in and present the band with anywhere from 20 to 30 new songs. Out of my batch, we would whittle them down to four or six for an album. Peter would get a songwriting credit when and if someone brought in a song, mostly finished, and he contributed a part. Ace, on the rare occasion he actually got up to work, might come in with a few songs. Paul would usually wait until the last minute, but somehow he would always come up with the goods. Neil said we would release them all on the same day. He envisioned shipping a million of each solo album. Bill had the idea to maintain some cohesiveness by having one artist do all four covers, and he suggested dedicating each album to the other guys in the band to keep up the mythology. Despite the dedications, we wished each other anything but good luck. So, after wrapping up Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, we each went off to make an album with no knowledge of what the others were doing. We all went off on our own, so I didn't hear any of the other albums until they were completed. And uh, to be totally honest with you, I never listened to any of those albums from beginning to end. You know, I listened to a couple of tracks and said, oh, this, is, this is interesting, this is okay, this is good, but I just tried to do the best album I could, and uh, it turned out to be, you know, the most well-received. Um, doesn't mean it's better, you know, but I kind of felt Back in 78, when I finished that album, and I mixed it, I was listening to it in my car, I said, you know, it's got a nice flow to it, it's got some nice variety. Uh, there's a song that I do called uh, I Can't Stop the Rain, and I open it up in an echo chamber like I'd be in a subway in New York, and I go, uh, this is New York, and it is very New York, and I did have, I did some tunes in New York City, but I did the rest out here, and what I was afraid of was LA musicians thinking, oh man, they're so laid back, and let's take that help salad break, and you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna really get no kick-ass music from them, and they're not gonna play real New York City for me. But I was fooled, because Vinny Poncia, my producer, uh, is from Brooklyn, and he grew up in the streets also, and he got musicians that really played very streetsy, very, very, very New Yorkish, which I needed very bad, because I'm from New York, and I'm proud of it, I'm really from Brooklyn, but. I had a lot of fun, actually. I didn't want to stray far from what KISS did, but it was great to be able to work with no tensions, no egos, and surrounded by talent. I started cutting demos at Electric Lady in New York, then went back out to LA to re-record them. 
After we cut a few of the songs, I realized they just didn't sound right. The demos might not have been perfect or the most fidelic, but they captured what I was looking for, so I decided to keep them and finish them. I liked the spontaneity and rawness. Then I cut another four or five new songs in LA. I had a band in New York and another one in Los Angeles. The only person who was in both was Bob Kulick. I wanted my solo album to be the greatest show on earth, with choirs and tons of special guest stars. My initial vision included everyone from Lassie to Jerry Lee Lewis to Lennon, who was still alive then, and McCartney. These weren't all possible, of course. Jerry Lee Lewis couldn't make it as a result of a scheduling conflict. Lassie, too, had a scheduling conflict. As for Lennon and McCartney, I called up their management and made an offer for them to appear on the album. When they said no, I hired two guys from Beatlemania, the Beatles' tribute stage show, to do the singing. As for the songs, Hold Me, Touch Me was about George Jan. I had flown off to see her frequently during downtime, and the song came from being away from her and hoping she was thinking of me when we weren't together. Most of the songs, however, were about Carol Kay, a stunner in Bill Coin's publicity department, whom I was seeing at the time and was crazy about. She was funny and smart and loved music, and the heat we generated at times could peel paint. Carol was romantically involved with someone else too, and I had been trying my damnedest to get her to stop seeing him. I basked in the drama of that classic love triangle, but I was desperate to pull her away from him. Tonight You Belong to Me and Wouldn't You Like to Know Me are about her. Tonight remained one of my favorite songs because of that tear your heart out passion and pain that I knew so well. Funny though, because the night Carol finally said, okay, I'll stop seeing him, it was as if somebody had turned a hose onto the bed where we were lying. I was suddenly drenched in sweat. I had a full-on panic attack. I searched for the right words, mumbling, trying to backpedal my way out, and come up with a plausible explanation for why I suddenly looked like I'd just gotten out of the shower. The truth was that so much of my life was about chasing approval, chasing acknowledgement, and chasing love, that when confronted with the chance to actually get approval, acknowledgement, and love, I was stunned. The reaction surprised me because in my mind I really thought being with her was the answer. But it was safer to just chase things. I wasn't equipped for the real thing. I mean, I've worked with a lot of producers, but uh, he set my drums up in the middle of the studio and set the musicians around me. And he was the only producer I've ever seen, instead of sitting behind the board inside the room, playing it cool, sits outside. And he also arranges, plays every instrument, sings. He sings, a lot of the songs you heard, he's singing on them. And uh, he won a Grammy. When I met Vinny, and I set up that way, I instantly got respect as, a, as an artist. And he didn't, never told me how to drum. Never once said drum this way, because he knew I, you know, what I, he, knew, he, he respected me. We're working side by side. It's a very close relationship. Early on, I took over Cherokee Studios in Los Angeles and called on musicians from other bands to come and help me do the demos of new songs. Joe Perry from Aerosmith came down and played a killer solo on one of the new songs. Katie Seagal, who I saw for a short time around the same time I was seeing Cher, I excitedly played Cher the new songs I'd been working on, but usually a blank stare came over her face. She never really understood our music. And I remember what, like it was yesterday, you know, that, that thud sound, you know, the, the beat. We were all stomping on boxes. Me, Eddie Kramer, a couple of other guys, the engineers. That's how we got that, that thud sound, you know. I recorded that album at this, a studio that used to be above Radio City. So all the rock cats that dance in the show used to have to go past the studio, the staircase, to go up to the roof and lay in the sun. You know, can't really dress, so uh, that's how it got started. Sometimes we get visits by rock, rock cats, sometimes we go up to the bridge, up to the roof and have a beer with them, you know. But, you know, nothing got too out of hand because I was really trying to be focused for this record. You want the best, but you got the best. 